So a warm welcome to everyone on this July 9th, where we have our fourth online session. And today our session is entitled Qualification of Armed Conflict and Determining the Applicable Law. Our learning objectives today will, to be in, will be to gain familiarity with what is a binary construct, the binary framework of international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict, is to develop an awareness of both the relevance and the utility of undertaking a qualification analysis. We also hope to gain an understanding of the definition of IAC and NIAC, that's international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. You'll see that we use these acronyms throughout the presentation. And we hope to also develop an understanding of the consequences for various actors of qualifying a conflict. So why do we qualify a conflict and what does that mean for those on the ground? And in particular, what does that mean for humanitarians working in a conflict situation? We'll also look to develop familiarity with the threshold indicia relevant to IAC and NIAC. This is an incredibly important uh, topic and it's it's not always the easiest to answer. So what we hope to do is to give you a sense of where to look and, and what to consider when you're trying to figure out if a situation is one that is regulated by human rights law and domestic law, or if it's an IAC or a NIAC and therefore regulated by IHL as well. And lastly, what we'll do is we will walk through a qualification analysis. And what we hope to do is then build on this in our next session in our fifth OLS where we look at Syria um, and the Ukraine. And so we'll walk through in very detailed fashion a qualification analysis in our next session. So today is to make sure we are all very familiar with the relevant construct. So with the ideas, with the principles, with the definitions, and with the terminology so that we can therefore make a very informed uh, discussion around how to qualify complicated and often very quickly changing environments. I'm incredibly pleased to introduce Noelle Quenivet. Um, it's an absolute privilege to have her with us today. Noelle is an Associate Professor in International Law at the University of the West of England. And Noelle will be with us today as we walk through uh, this very interesting and important topic. What I'd like to do is also remind those of you who are interested that at the end of today's session, you may take a two-part assessment to better, um, to better understand sort of the knowledge gained um, so that we can help you figure out the knowledge acquisition that hopefully took place during the event today. There will be a code, and that will be made available at the end of today's session. The code is 3258, but we will repeat that in due course. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Noel, and we will begin the session. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for this introduction. Can you hear me properly? Yes, I hope can. so. It, it sounds very good. Fantastic. OK, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So first, before I start, I'd like to thank PHAP for inviting me to speak on this what I think is a fascinating topic, which is the qualification of armed conflict. So I really hope you will enjoy the topic too. Some of you might find this is a purely academic exercise, um, but it certainly not is, and I will very soon uh, show you that. Indeed, the applicability of IHL, I will call it IHL from now on, International Humanitarian Law, depends on the existence of an armed conflict. So it's really crucial to be able to ascertain whether there is an armed conflict of an international or non-international nature. If a conf um, I don't have a ah, I've got the button, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not that familiar with the system. So if a conflict is international, then the Geneva Conventions will be applicable. And if the states have ratified the Additional Protocol 1, the rules contained in the Additional Protocol will also be applicable. We should also not forget that customary international law relating to international armed conflict applies too. 
Now we have a different situation that is of a conflict which is non-international and here we have to distinguish between two types of non-international armed conflicts. First, we have those that are covered by Common Article 3 and then we have those that are falling within the ambit of Additional Protocol 2. So then we do have also two different sets of rules that apply. So we have two different types of non-international armed conflict. Again, the relevant customary norms applicable in non-international armed conflict will be relevant. And these are really, really important. Why? Because we have so little treaty rules relating to non-international armed conflicts. So very often we focus our attention on customary international relating to non-international armed conflict. So don't worry too much about the details for now because I will go back to this bit by bit. So let's have a look at two introductory points. The first one is the use of the concept of armed conflict. I keep on talking about an armed conflict and I will not talk about war. The second point is that strictly speaking there is no definition of an armed conflict in IHL. But we have a definition of an international armed conflict and a definition, actually two definitions, of non-international armed conflict. So in other words, when I mention armed conflict, it's not really something we know in IHL, but I will get back to this again. So let's have a look at point one. First. So prior to um, 1949, the whole range of illegal instruments relating to international humanitarian law referred to war. 1949 is the year when the Geneva Conventions were adopted. So the, the sort of legal instruments we have are, for example, the Convention related, Respecting the Laws and Customs of War on Land, which we know as the Hague Convention. Another example which does use the word war is the protocol for the prohibition of the use in war of asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and of bacteriological methods of warfare, which you probably better know as just the Geneva Gas Protocol. So you see both of them have in the title war and the applicability of these instruments was predicated on the declaration of war and during the negotiations for the adoption of the Geneva Conventions states decided to change this approach and to remove all forms of political considerations for the sake of alleviating suffering in armed conflict so from now on I will only be referring to an armed conflict The second point is, as I explained, we have no definition of, of an armed conflict in international humanitarian law, but we actually have a in definition of an international armed conflict and then two definitions of a non-international armed conflict. So why is it so? Well, it is so because states were never keen on accepting norms related to internal matters. And as a result, they were not keen at all on regulating their behavior towards armed groups. In other words, states believe this is within the framework of my own state territorial sovereignty. So as a result, there's a difference in the regulation of international and non-international armed conflicts. And also, the regulation of international armed conflict is much more detailed, much more elaborate than the regulation in non-international armed conflict. Yet, and that is true, some of the overarching principles, and Elizabeth did mention some of them, which she had seen in some of the previous sessions, like the principle of distinction, the principle of proportionality, the principle of humanity, these principles do apply in all armed conflicts. But the detailed regulation will then depend on the type of the armed conflict. So what are the differences? So for example, the concept of a combatant only exists in an international armed conflict. So if somebody says, oh, um, these people are combatants, that this means that this is an international armed conflict, provided the person indeed is correct in international humanitarian law. And the same thing is also the case with a prisoner of war. So you cannot have prisoners of war in a non-international armed conflict. So now let's have a look at humanitarian access, which is really relevant for you. So first, there is a difference between international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. So additional protocol one, 
which regulates international armed conflict, obliges parties to the conflict and also state parties to the additional protocol, which are not parties to the conflict, to allow and to facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of all relief consignments. So in other words, third states are addressed in international armed conflict treaty rules in the context of facilitating access. But there is nothing like this, there are no concomitant obligations under treaty rules relating to a non-international armed conflict. So third states are not obliged to facilitate or allow passage of such relief consignments in, an, in a non-international armed conflict. Second, there's a difference between an international armed conflict and occupation. So I have to, to be a bit um, more precise here, occupation is a form of international armed conflict, okay? But yet, in relation to humanitarian access, we make a difference. So the obligation on the part of a state that is a party to the conflict to allow and facilitate access is much more stringent in the context of occupation. In occupation, there is no need for the agreement of a state party, whereas in another type of international armed conflict, we do have a caveat subject to the agreement of a state. So this is really important then to know really the difference between international and non-international armed conflicts and the impact this has in practice. So as you can see, this classification is important and it is important for a number of actors and these are states, of course, uh, armed forces and armed groups because they will have to uh, comply with different sets of rules. Also for courts, be they national, international and hybrid. United Nations, we'll go back to this a bit later, especially the Security Council. Important for those of you who are working with NGOs, but also important for individuals, in particular when looking at criminal responsibility. Because some war crimes are indeed war crimes in an international armed conflict, but that doesn't mean that it's a war crime in a non-international armed conflict. So again, the importance of the um, classification of a conflict. So now the question, next question is actually, how do we classify the conflict? So this classification is made objectively. It's a presence of objective facts that will determine whether there is an armed conflict of an international or non-international nature. In other words, the qualification is a fact-based contextual assessment, which also means that you can ask an international humanitarian law, oh, what's the type of conflict we have in country X, well, if that person doesn't know the situation in country X, the person will not be able to answer the question. So it is really important to look at what is going on on the grounds. So the next is actually who makes this determination. So in some instances, the ICRC will provide a qualification of a conflict, and it has, for example, done so with regard to the non-international armed conflict in the east of Ukraine in July 2004. That's something you will be looking at the next session. Also, United Nations bodies, such as the Security Council, might remind parties of the obligations under IHL, thereby implying that there is an armed conflict, though often the Security Council will not explain whether it believes the conflict to be international or non-international. States also which are involved in the armed conflict will have to make such a determination in order to ensure that the armed forces comply with the relevant law. Some states, in case of doubt, have declared that as a matter of policy, so it's policy decision, it's not a matter of law, that they will use the stringent legal framework relating to international armed conflicts, just to be on the safe side, so to say. So, and in other words, the qualification, sorry, in other cases, the qualification is made after the conflict, when prosecuting war crimes, when examining violations, or even when examining compensation requests. So you see, there is no sole arbiter in deciding what is the qualification of the armed conflict. So now that we are aware of the importance of this distinction, let's have a look at the concept of an armed conflict. So as I said at the beginning, IHL never refers to an, in, to an armed conflict as such, but refers to an armed conflict of international or non-international nature. So there's no umbrella category of armed conflict. That being said, there's a definition that pretty much everyone used, and I think it was also in your reading list, um, 
but it has been provided by the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, in the Tadic case. We have to be careful when we examine this definition because it stems from an international criminal tribunal. And sometimes these tribunals will adopt different definitions and requirements than those that are stipulated in IHL. So that means that I will only use the case law from these tribunals when they are relevant for IHL purposes. So let's go and examine in detail this definition. So I'm going to read and sort of break it into bits and pieces. So an armed conflict exists whenever there is a resort to armed force between states. So I'll make a pause here. There's no pause in the quotation, but I'll make a pause there because that simply is a classical international armed conflict. A state is fighting against another state, is using armed force. Then Let's continue. All protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organized armed groups or between such groups within a state. So what we need here is protracted armed violence. Protracted gives the impression that the conflict is lasting for a certain period of time, but I will explain this later. It has not been understood and interpreted in that regard. So it's not a temporal element at all. Also here, we use the word armed violence, not so much hostilities, but in the case law, it's going to be pretty much the same. We have two types of non-international armed conflicts here, as you see, between government authorities and organized armed groups. That's one type, so between the state and the group. And then the second type is between such groups, so an armed group against another armed group. So again, uh, we do have uh, quite a good definition of an armed conflict, but as I said, we don't have such a definition in Tashmere law. So now let's turn our attention to the definitions of an armed conflict according to IHR. Before we do that, I'd like to mention that we have a study on custom international humanitarian law. And the study mentions very often that a particular rule principle of proportionality, for example, is applicable in international and non-international armed conflicts. Well, the sad thing of that study on custom international humanitarian law is that although it does use this binary system of international and non-international armed conflict, it doesn't define these types of armed conflict. So we do have to rely on the treaty definitions. So let's have a look at an international armed conflict first. So an international armed conflict is defined in Common Article 2 to the Geneva Conventions, and I will just read the text and we'll discuss it. The, pre present, sorry, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if a state of war is not recognized by one of them. So, the conflict is between two parties, two states, um, and I would like to mention at this point that all states are parties to the Geneva Convention, so this is not a problem at all. What we have is a trickier situation, is when there is resort to armed force against a state, and this can be attributed to another state, then it is an international armed conflict. So, an example of this is when a state controls an armed group, that is fighting against another state. So in this case, what is really important is that we need to prove the link between the state and the armed group to show that in reality, the conflict is between two states. There are divergent views as to whether the test of this control is that of overall or effective control, but that's something probably we can discuss in the Q&A session. So whether there is a declaration of war or not doesn't matter, as the idea is that there are some hostilities between the two parties. The text itself, Common Article 2, does not refer to any threshold of applicability. And if you look at the ICRC commentary, I'll just try to explain, the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols have an official commentary that goes with it. So it's quite useful to, to look at it. So the ICRC commentary to Common Article 2 suggests that the conventions apply even when there is, and I quote, only a single wounded person as a result of a conflict. That's how low the threshold is. 
So the international armed conflict starts at the very moment two members of the armed forces of two states clash, and even a border skirmish triggers the applicability of the conventions. That being said, in reality, such occurrences are viewed as armed incidents and do not trigger the applicability of the convention. When does such a conflict finish. So the applicability of the Geneva Convention ceases with the close of the military operations, but it will continue to apply to certain individuals such as prisoners of war and internees. Both the conventions and the protocols are silent with regard to the geographical scope of application, in other words, where does it apply. I shall that's sort of practice more. IHL applies throughout the territory of the state, which is a party to the armed conflict. Some rules will apply directly to the territory or the territories in which there are hostilities, example, targeting rules, whilst others, especially those related to prisoner of war, um, apply in areas that are not necessarily in or even near the area where the hostilities are taking place. Here, the important um, idea is that there's a nexus between the conflict and the person. Common Article 2 is not finished. It continues actually with a reference to occupation and it reads, the convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Note that it mentions total or partial occupation. So the question now is, well, when does occupation start? Well, we have to go back, actually, to the Hague Regulation that in Article 42 explains that, and I quote, the occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established and can be exercised. So in other words, the key question is, can the state, so in my little uh, diagram, can state B run, manage, administer the territory. That is really the threshold of applicability. Two examples that we do have here are in 2002-2003, the presence of Ugandan armed forces in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that was noted in the Lubanga case before the International Court, Court and also by the International Court of Justice in the Democratic Republic of Congo against Uganda case. Another example would be in 2003, the presence of US forces in Iraq. I'm pretty much sure that when I mentioned occupation, the first example that probably came to your mind was that of Israel and the occupied territories. So here it must be remembered that this is a very unique situation. It's a very atypical situation because of a historical context. So at the moment, I'm just trying to provide you with rather simple examples. Um, and you will have, of course, more time to delve into the complexity of such issues, either in the Q&A session, if you want to ask questions, or in the next session. Also, a last point is that the definition in Common Article 2 explains that the lack of armed resistance does not preclude the application of the Geneva Conventions. A modern example would be Crimea, but again, I'll leave that to the next speaker in the next session. The concept of an international armed conflict has been expanded by Article 1.4 of the Additional Protocol to incorporate what is commonly known as wars of national liberation. I said commonly known because the definition in IHR is a bit longer and more complicated. But I won't go into any further details and it has very little contemporary relevance. Just bear in mind that it's not a different type of an international armed conflict. It's an expansion of the definition in Common Article 2 to the Geneva Conventions. So we only have one type of international armed conflict. So now let's move on to um, non-international armed conflicts. And here we need to examine two sources, Common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions and Article 1 of the Additional Protocol 2. So these are two separate, distinct types of non-international armed conflict. Common Article 3 is often called a mini-convention because it's the only provision relating to non-international armed conflict within the Geneva Conventions, and because also it contains overarching principles. Common Article 3 provides a set of minimum standards applicable in, and I quote, the case of armed conflict not of an international character occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties. 
So as you can see, Common Article 3 doesn't say much. It doesn't provide any criteria. So we can only deduce two um, elements there. The first one is that the conflict is limited to the state where the conflict is taking place, a bit like a classical um, civil war, which is my example on the left with state A and the armed groups. But this interpretation has been challenged recently. I'll explain that also later. And the second element is that common article 3 is applicable between two groups also, and not only between a state and the armed group. This is my second um, picture on the, on the right. So in other words, this means that common article 3 would apply between so-called warlords in Africa and to, or to the conflict in Somalia. So are there some requirements? Because I seems there should be some threshold, and indeed, in practice, there has been some threshold. Yes, there are, but not in the text itself, and this has allowed states to simply deny that Common Article 3 applies. So, for example, the French government in 1956, after several years of saying, oh, the conflict in Nigeria is not a conflict, um, France is only suppressing and uprising, where well, in 1956 they admitted, yes, Common Article 3 applies. Now, what I would like to do is to hear from you. What do you think are the requirements for a situation to be characterized as a non-international armed conflict according to Common Article 3? Remember, there is nothing in the text, so we have to find what these requirements can be. So you can see now a poll appear on your screen, and I would like you to choose one of the options. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Um, it is interesting that half of you um, believe that the requirements are the intensity of the hostilities, the level of organization of the armed group, and the control of a part of the territory. Well, that is not the correct answer. The correct answer is actually the intensity of the hostilities and the level of organization of the armed group. So I'll go back and explain this a bit better. You're half right, I would say, <laughs> in relation to the intensity of the hostilities, the level of organization of the armed group, and the control of its part of the territory. But these are the requirements not for a common Article 3 um, conflict, but for an additional Protocol 2 conflict, which is a higher threshold. So when we go back to the ICRC uh, commentary, they have some requirements, some indicators. I can't actually say requirements, um, indicators. And these are that the hostilities are conducting by organized armed group, that the hostilities exhibit such intensity that the government cannot rely simply on ordinary policing methods, that the hostilities have a collective character, and that the Insurgents show some degree of organization, and usually this means that they have a responsible command and the capacity to meet the minimal humanitarian requirements. So in other words, these requirements of these indicators could be summarized, as the ICTY and the ICC have done, as the intensity of the hostilities and the organization of the armed groups. So these are the two elements we look at in the case of a common Article 3 conflict. I'd also like to note that um, the courts, the ICTY and the ICC, have um, decided, well, they haven't decided, but they have actually created a list of um, indicators for each of these elements, for the intensity and for the organization of the armed group. I won't go into the details, but if you want to know more, I'm happy to, to discuss this in the Q&A session. So now let's have a look at the second type of non-international armed conflict, that is Article 1 of the Additional Protocol 2 to the Geneva Conventions. This type of armed conflict only exists if a state has ratified Additional Protocol 2. So the current conflict in, C in Syria is not an AP2 conflict, for the simple reason that Syria is, has not ratified the AP2. So it might look like it is, but it is not, because Syria has not ratified the Additional Protocol 2. So here I'd like to remind you that Additional Protocol 2 only contains a limited number of rules, and this is largely due to sovereignty concerns. 
but also because of his concerns, i.e. states unwilling to be bound by international law in the, in the internal affairs, they spelled out this time, they were not going to be caught twice, this time they spelled out clear requirements regarding the threshold of applicability. So whereas Common Article 3 doesn't say much, this time we do have quite a lot of um, elements. So first, there's a lower threshold, which explains what has to be discarded. So AP2 is not applicable to, and I read, situations of internal disturbances and tensions, such as riots, isolated and sporadic acts of violence, and other acts of a similar nature. So it is like also accepted that this lower threshold is also applicable to common Article 3 armed conflicts. So in many cases, individual separate acts of terrorism do not reach the minimum threshold. Violence in urban areas reaching a high level of intensity and organization, such as that in the favelas in Brazil, might indeed do so, but they would fail to fulfill the more stringent requirements set out in Article 1, 1 of the AP2. So these requirements are the ones that need to be fulfilled, and you need to tick each of them. So the first requirement is that the conflict takes place in the territory of a party to the additional protocol uh, two. Then the conflict is between the armed forces of the state and the armed group. Also, the group needs to be under responsible command and the group needs to exercise such control over part of the territory so as to, en be, to enable them to carry out sustained and concerted military actions and to implement the protocol. So these requirements, when you look at them again, they can be summarized as intensity of the conflict, organization of the group, and something that about half of you did mention when I did the poll, the control of the territory. This is really one of the crucial differences between common article 3 and additional protocol um, 2. So this is, in fact, a higher threshold of applicability uh, than the one in Common Article 3. Because remember, Common Article 3, we only need the intensity and the organization. Here, we need to show that the armed group is in control of the territory. And also, another difference is that Common Article 3 applies to state against armed group and armed group against armed group. But in the definition of the Israel Protocol 2, it only applies to hostilities between the state and the armed group, and not between two armed groups. So in reality, the protocol applies to situations at or near the level of a force scale, what we used to call civil war. So past examples are the conflict in Colombia between the FARC and the government, or the first conflict in Chechnya, or the conflict also uh, between the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. When do they start to apply? Well, very easy, not really easy, easy to say, which is that they start when the criteria are fulfilled. Well, very difficult to ascertain when the criteria are fulfilled. And they also cease to apply when the criteria are not met anymore. Same problem, when are the criteria not met anymore? As for the geographical scope, there is no definition and it's often been stated that the armed conflict is not limited to the war front or to the narrow geographical context of the actual combat operations. So now what I will do is I will walk you through a conflict classification. I'll do that a bit quicker um, because we have looked at the details just to uh, sort of set the foundations for the next session where you will indeed be looking at the examples of um, conflict like um, Syria and Ukraine. So remember, we don't have a clear definition of an armed conflict, but we have international and non-international armed conflicts. In terms of international armed conflict, they are defined in Common Article 2 of the Geneva Conventions. It's the use of armed force of one state against another state or states, and also it covers total or partial occupation if not met, if, even if not met with resistance. And we say also that the definition that we have in Common Article 2 has been expanded to include wars of national liberation. So what is the, the law applicable? The law applicable is the Geneva Conventions, the Additional Protocol 
One, provided it has been ratified, so the US has not ratified it short Protocol 1. And of course, we do have customary law that applies. Now, let's have a look at a non-international armed conflict. You can already see that I put a big blue dotted line in the middle. Why? Because we have two different types of non-international armed conflict. So the first one is a common Article 3, Geneva Conventions uh, conflict. It's within the state territory, between the state and the armed group and between the arm, or between the armed groups. In the text, we have no clear threshold, but we have realized that the intensity of the hostilities and the organization of the armed group are indicators, are almost requirements to, uh, for Common Article 3 to apply. The second type of non-international armed conflict we have is in Article 1, AP2. We have a lower threshold, so we're discarding internal disturbances, riots, tensions, and the like. And we have a higher threshold, so these are clearly set requirements. These are legal requirements, unlike in Common Article 3. So this, the conflict has to take place within the state territory, between armed forces and the armed group. The group has to be under responsible command. It has to control the territory so as to carry out sustained and concerted military operations and to be able to implement additional protocol too. So what is the law applicable here? Well, for Common Article 3, we only have Common Article 3, sadly enough. Well, thank God we do have customary law. And that is very, very useful. So do look at the study on custom international internal law because you will find that, in fact, a lot of the regulation, um, a lot of the principles that we have also in international armed conflict do apply in non-international armed conflict. When we have a non-international armed conflict of the AP2 type, so of course, additional protocol 2 applies, but common article 3 also applies since it's the lower threshold. And again, look at customary international law, very, very important here, simply because we have so little actually in the treaties. So what are the challenges of this classification? The number of challenges that we have, the first one is one which relates to what I would call space and time. Um, it must be remembered that in one single geographical place, it is possible to have a non-international and an international armed conflict at the same time, depending on who is fighting who. Okay? Also, in one single geographical place, it's possible that over a period of time, a non-international armed conflict transforms into an international armed conflict and vice versa. So it's really, really important to look at the facts. What is happening now? Moreover, the traditional distinction between an international and a non-international armed um, conflict has been questioned by recent developments. So we start to have hybrid conflicts. Don't use this terminology because this is incorrect, because in international internal, we only have international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. But what has happened is that we have a number of conflicts that don't seem to readily fit into one of the types of armed conflict. So these are internationalized, non-international armed conflict. We also have transnational armed conflict, or some people call them extraterritorial non-international armed conflict. And we have internalized international armed conflict. I think we can leave this for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm now looking forward to answering your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, much appreciated. This was a, an, an impressively clear explication of a very detailed and nuanced topic. Um, so we will now move on to the questions. We've received quite a few excellent questions. <clears throat> but before that, I'd like to make note of the assessment code for those of you who are interested in undertaking this evaluation, which will be available immediately following the event today. That assessment code is 3258. 3258. And also a recording, <clears throat> excuse me, a recording of Noel's lecture will also be made available shortly after this event. As a reminder, this Q&A that we will now participate in will not be recorded. So as I mentioned,